condition assessment. Afternoon. Yeah. So the last class was for facility condition assessment. Yeah, my major takeaway was the facility condition index. Um, okay. uh, that is the formula for calculating the index, which goes a long way to teach me how to present a business case. For example, I was going to present a business case yesterday and the, um, the guy, the manager, the facility manager of that firm was trying to make me do something lesser than what I was proposing. So I had to use this index formula and he was surprised that I could give him that kind of formula. I told him that, see, if you look at the cost you want to use to do this, if you multiply it by the cost of the new one and you divide it by 100, see what your, your, your asset is telling you. So it's better for you to do this instead of to do that. He submitted and he just told me that, you know what, just give me a breakdown of what you want to do and let's see what happens. So I knew that I won him in that, in that instance. So that was a good one for me. That's very good. Um, repairs divided by base. That's the yes. ratio called the index, right? So if yes. you're going to yes. fix something for 100,000, um, and that thing can be replaced with 1 million, it's 100,000 divided by 1 million. 0 0.1 is the index, okay? Yes. 10%. yes. All right, yes. thanks for this here. Um, FCI uh, lessons like Chris is not there. Uh, Victor, please go ahead and give us your lessons there. Good afternoon once again, sir. Yeah, Victor. And your take it away for yesterday, the uh, process of uh, facilitating where the made mention of the pieces of the uh, facility condition assessment, especially the phase one, which is designing the assessment, and also where he made mentions of the instruments needed that are required for this assessment measuring devices, data cable, sorry, data capture devices, cameras, protective gears. So those were my major takeaway from yesterday. Thank you, sir. That's it. Bian Nana, can you please take the mic? Uh, good evening, sir. And uh, good evening, uh, fellow colleagues. Okay, for my take from the last uh, session, uh, the principal was on the need for proper conduct of our facility condition uh, assessment. And uh, that, if it is properly done, it is easy for you to plan uh, your budget for the year because uh, you can capture what are the major issues from your inspections, interactions, interview, to be able to get what the key issues are and in line with what are the strategic uh, objectives or goals of the company, you can align your maintenance plan with those objectives and it's easy for you to get management uh, buy-in. Thank you. Thank you so much, that was fantastic. Toby Laba. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Um, the full of process of evaluating the of evaluating uh, the building or the facility, and uh, it, which has a uh, long and short term advantages and benefits. One of which is um, measuring the performance together with the companies of organizations that goals and objectives and also customer service delivery, which is uh, my take from the last class. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot, bye-bye. Chris. Uh, 
Chris, you are muted. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, your audio is okay. good now. I say good evening, class, and good evening, sir. To miss you for two days. Yes. I appreciate your coming back. Thank you. Okay. Uh, some of uh, my take home last was uh, on facility condition assessment element, which include the uh, building interior. I have a mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. There are so many others which uh, we did, and many others. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. Let's hear from Emmanuel E. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, that is good. Okay, so I think what I got as already said, the uh, facility condition assessment helps you basically provide more for your end users. That's the, the whole picture from doing an assessment. So that's what's my takeaway from the last class, generally. Thank you. Okay. Chaos. Okay. For me, facility condition assessment was a, a a good one for me i when i go went through the the material i i really found that that for one to be a successful manager in a new facility that should be the first thing one should do because the fact that it will give you a clear picture of the position of the facility and the uh, help you prioritize your operation and so i think it's quite a, a good one for me thank you that was very good our way you take away from the last class good evening sir good evening yes yeah my take away from the last class was of the objective of facility condition assessment. The, uh, the things that entails, some, some, even some of those things we do it, but due to the, uh, the fact that we don't know the approaches. So I've been, uh, I've been exposed to asset register as regards facility condition assessment. It's extra cost estimate, prioritize maintenance, retail, renewal. And also compare your cost and you know, you know the uh, the facts about your facility, maybe the ages and some things that are happening there, and how to evaluate them, present to the management so as to get uh, get a solution and a justifying documentation as well. So that was my takeaway, sir. Very good, thank you, Kingsley. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Yeah, so I'm just joining the class. I'm very sorry. I don't know. I'm just entering. You're in the last, class. You're in the last class. As I was in the last class. Yes. What did you learn? One minute. Okay, one minute is uh, we is on a facility condition assessment. So it's just to make us understand the importance of um, knowing the condition of your facility, and also how to make decision, making use of FCI okay. as the facility condition index. Okay, fantastic. When? I didn't get that. You can take away from the last class. I didn't get what you said. Give us your take away from the last class. No, I just said that now, Kingsley. Oh, no, not Kingsley. I'm talking about Wayne now. Wayne, you're muted. Wayne is okay. Okay. Now. Can you hear me now? Yes, your audio is good. Yeah. From my previous class, uh, I learned the theory uh, ways to do FCA. One is uh, drive through, second one is crawl through, and uh, the last one is uh, uh, walk through. So this theory. Uh, ways of doing it give us different kind of information. The drive through will give you some information, but not as detailed information as a crawl through and walk through. That's what I learned. Very good. Thank you so much. That's good. Maiwa. Good 
Good evening, sir. Good evening. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks, sir. Um, for my like, I mean, last last, my take home was on um, the benefits and why we conduct um, facility condition assessment and also the levels, the drive by, the top down, the walk through, the crawl through. Which um, the cross through is um, the the basic one. That like, is the more uh, to get more information from um, the uh, and the facility and also um, data collection techniques. How we get our data? Uh, you said we had talked about using survey of um, using a um, survey, probably the satisfaction survey or user survey. Then also interviews, conducting yeah. interviews, and also we talked about. Okay. Um, we get in information by visual review and also from staffs, the facility staffs like that, sir. Yes, sir. Super. Super. Thank you very much. That was very Thank good. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Ibrahim. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Yeah, um, actually. I, I came late to the last class. So I can't really say much about uh, the previous class. Okay, you were not there. Yeah, I, I came late. I came late, I think about uh, 30 minutes before the end of the class. Wow. And the, the network really was. Material. Yes. You didn't really matter that. You said? Did you read the material that was sent? Yeah, actually, I I don't read it. That has to change. You I will surely do. I will surely read the material immediately. Receiving very important, short, not very long, but it gives you a lot of yeah. background ideas of what we're going to be discussing. Um, was there an assignment in that assessment in that material? Yes, I saw. I saw. I saw the assessment. Okay. It is an assessment. That assessment is already due. Uh, 17 minutes ago, right? So, uh, if you haven't read it, then you've not done the assessment. Let's let's be up and doing, okay? Ibrahim, yeah, I will do so. Let us do our program. All right. Uh, Chibi, yeah, give us a takeaway from the last class. Yes, good evening, everybody. Um, in the last class, uh, I was my takeaway was about uh, knowing that when it comes to facility condition assessment, you should know very well about inspections. You should know very well about understanding the assets in question. And also you must also know the conditions of the assets. And uh, secondly, uh, knowing that for a deteriorating asset, you must consider FCI, which means uh, facility condition index, which means the repair cost the ratio of the repair costs as against the uh, cost of replacement, you must take note of that and know that there are various uh, ranges that you must consider for you know, repair replacement. Thank you very much. Anthony. Anthony, sit on. Yeah, hello. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. Well, um, I, what we, my takeaway from the last um, class um, is about, um, you know, knowing your, that's your facility very well, trying to understand your facility. Like um, the FCA, <clears throat> which is the facility condition assessment of every property which you manage. You know, before you go into the management, you must understand the facility condition of that particular asset before you go into it. You know, the, it's very important for us to be abreast with the with the with the property itself. You understand? Hello, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Definitely, your audio is good. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes, your audio is good. Hello. Okay, 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 okay. I'm getting. Hello. Yes. Okay. So, <clears throat> hello. 
Yes, we hear you. Just go ahead. Hello? Yes, we hear you very well. Uh, you might need to unplug your headset if the headset is giving you issues and talk straight into the computer or the phone. Hello? The video is good, the audio is good, but you don't seem to be hearing back from us. Anthony, just take away your headset and speak straight to your device, okay? All right, um, we'll move on to Moses in the meantime. Moses, please give us a takeaway. Yeah, hey, look, can you hear me now, sir? Okay, so, I'm uh, using my phone, phone. can you hear yes. me? Right. Yes, we hear you very well. Oh. I'm not really getting Hello, Anthony. We hear you very well. Go ahead. We hear you very well. Okay. That, that's a technology uh, from Anthony's end. Uh, Moses. You're muted. I mean, All right. Good afternoon, all. Good afternoon. Yeah, from my from the last lesson, I understood that uh, it's very important for us to engage professionals in carrying out the facility conditions assessments because our main knowledge might not be enough. Uh, we would require services of building professionals like architects who require services of plumber and electrician that will help us to look in depth into the building fabric, in depth into the various facilities in the building so that we can have uh, the right data. And then we need to make the data succinct enough in our presentations to the client so that they understand the consequences or they understand the advantages of making decisions we would inform them. We need to do something like a benefit cost analysis over a period of time that if they are going to adopt these recommendations from our facility conditions assessment, this will be the advantage and this will be the benefit over a period of time. Thank you. Super, thank you so much. All right, um, I think everybody have, okay, Emma, are you there? Yes, good evening, yeah. sir. Good evening, welcome, give us a takeaway. Okay, um, I learned from the previous class that in bringing out to get funds from your top management, you have to give them a well detailed analysis of all the facility conditions in order for them to see reasons why you need funds. And I think um, diagrams too, and all that. So that may take up. Very good. That's good. Uh, Tosin, I did it. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Sorry, I'm in quite, um, um, I mean, my background is a little bit uh, noisy. Please uh, mind with me as a prisoner manager. <laughs> yes, my takeaway for the last class uh, was the process. You know, I mean, uh, of the facility condition assessment that I'm talking about the report. I tend to have, okay, more comprehensive um, um, uh, checks and uh, I make uh, some reports, but what I have, the, the, the table of report, you know, makes it easier for me to have a concise uh, report. Uh, fair enough, uh, for our management, though we have some close people that are more, though it's a facility management company, and uh, we're about um, ensuring our facility is up and running, uh, very functional, and um, uh, practicing the latest as we want to like ensure uh, the global standard is, is applied. So for what I have as a takeaway, it's actually the report where it talks about um, 
um, the asset location for where an asset um, that maybe is identified that has um, some defects. So they help me to tell, okay, asset location, asset category, description of the asset, condition of asset, the uh, description of the defect. So that one is actually uh, more key for me, description of the defect, then the assessment condition, is it major or is it minor, okay? So if it's major as in, in fact, what I do now is, so if it's major, I do it in red, you know, then recommendations of what has to be done almost immediately. You know, that simplified a lot of things for me. That's, That's a good application. That's a good way of applying it. Thank you, well done. Um, Emmanuel T, how many people do you have with you in the office, in the training center? Uh, good afternoon, sir. I just have one. Uh, son, uh, new, new intake. So, can you please introduce yourself? We have a new joiner. Your name, where you work, what you do, and uh, what you hope to get out of this program. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, um, my name is Razak Yusuf. Um, I work as um, Food service uh, and facility, uh, food service and facility and uh, project management engineer with Seiko Electronics. Okay. So um, okay. I want to make it of uh, this training as an opportunity to dive into facility management proper as a career. Very good. Very good. Good choice. You're in the right place. Welcome. Thank all you. right. So um, now that we've done all the introductions and lessons learned from the last class. I need to find out if we have any problem to solve today. Anybody with a technical, career, professional, business problem that you want to bring for us to resolve in the next 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes. All right, Francis has one. Let's, let's hear you. Francis, you're muted. Yes, okay. Can you hear me now, sir? Yes, go ahead. So I have a business I'm trying to propose. So there is this facility, it's a new, newly built facility, about 21 yes. units of three bedrooms. And I'm trying to, I think I've told you about it. I'm trying to get to manage it as a facility manager. So I'm mm -hmm. thinking, what should I do first? And who should I meet first? So let me tell you, I have um, the, the owner is my friend's dad, and he has decided to give it out. Of course, somebody must manage it. So I'm talking to my friend to talk to his dad. That we can manage it in partnership with him, but I will be the one fronting us. And it's one of the reasons I came to do this course, so that if in case they ask some questions. So I want to know what should I do first, and what are the things to do after? Okay, so the first thing is to make the approach and be allowed to do an inspection of the services and the facilities on ground, right? And then you do a proposal, which you can be able to get up from the on site team, for example, um, get a sense of your access to the facility, and then ask to know what services you would like to outsource, right? So uh, make a list of all FM services and use that as a questionnaire to check with them. Do you want to outsource uh, housekeeping or uh, cleaning? Yes. You want to outsource fumigation? Yes. You want to outsource uh, uh, either laundry service? Indicates. Reception service? Indicates. Electrical maintenance? Indicates. Plumbing maintenance? You make a long list of all FM services. And you get them to say, yes, 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 no, 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 this one I want to do it in house, this one I want to give it to somebody else, and so on and so forth. It is based on that, you will now say, let me come and prepare a proposal, right? That proposal is going to use the, um, the, the asset register and the site plan of that particular uh, location. Um, to be built in terms of so you can know the extent of quantities. For example, there will be number of ACs, there will be number of cleaning required, cleaners required. There will be number of so you need to you know start getting into all of those services one by one. Okay, um, so the first thing is make a long list of services, 
and check um, with them on which one they want to outsource, okay? Um, since we've talked about it, don't worry, we can keep talking about it. Once you have your list, send it to me on WhatsApp, I'll review it and I'll, I'll let you know. Once they fix the ones they want to have into it, you can let me have um, a look again and then I can guide you from there, okay? Okay, so in this case, the occupants are not there yet. I think they've sold almost all the properties, but they've not completed the interiors of some parts. So they've not started using yes. it. That means I have to deal with the owner or I have to get the contact of all the occupants. If no, no, no. Buyers, you are dealing with the owner for common areas for now. Yes. The services yes. you are proposing, proposing now yes. should only so common cover areas. common areas. Until okay. the owner starts coming in, they can now contract with them individually. Okay. Okay. So for now, the common borehole, the common power, the common site maintainers, the common uh, lights for street lights and the red drainage maintenance obligation, those are what you want to scope for now. And that's the only okay. thing you can discuss with the developer at this stage. Okay. Okay. All right. I get it. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. And Tony. Yeah, hello, can you hear me now, sir? Yes, the audio is good. Okay, okay, so uh, because I have to now over and reconnect again, you know. Okay. Yeah, uh, my takeaway from the last sorry uh, before you start, sorry before you start, please let people who are not talking mute their uh their own. The noise is yeah. coming out. I think it was uh uh when uh, Francis was speaking, there was a noise in his background. So once he was speaking, we muted him and the noise went off. Thank you, Wayne. Go ahead, Anthony. Okay, so, so my takeaway from the last uh, uh, lecture was about that the reasons why we, the reasons for conducting an FCE, you know, I really picked quite a lot of things from there. You know, one of the reasons is that whether is it for a short term uh, financial needs, or whether it's competitive needs, long-term needs, or building stewardship, you know. Um, I will, I've been having challenges, you know, in conducting, uh, you know, my FCA. That's, that's a particular property I've been discussing with somebody for some time. So the person have granted me an asset, assets into the property, but um, we don't have a tenant for now. You know, it's a luxury apartment, but for now, there is no tenant. We are trying to see how to get a tenant in, you know. So, but with this, I've been able to know what and what I need to do, you know, in terms of uh, getting the property ready before the new tenants will come in, you know. It has really helped me, and I've picked quite a lot of things from there. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, sir. I'm going to initiate um, uh, a, a release of your project dockets. Um, we have templates for generating your asset register and your uh, consumer assessment and the other projects that you will do at the end of this project, this program. We will not wait till that time when you have finished all your lessons to be able to have the docket. So I'm going to instruct uh, Maraka to uh, issue out these uh, uh, documents to all of you, whether you have. Uh, paid your fees or not. So when you have a project and you need to start documenting the asset register question assessment, you take that as a guide to start working on them and you can start submitting them. It's possible for you to finish your project before you even finish your three months in class and you can graduate with us in December if that happens for you, okay? So we're gonna give you those, those uh, project dockets as well. And uh, um, uh, so when you have a new project or a site you want to mobilize or even your current site and you want to show a uh, value of what you are doing for the organization, Start working on your projects now. We, we don't want to wait to the end anymore, and that will help you, um, uh, Anthony, um, in, um, in 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 getting some kind of guidelines and the templates for your condition assessment. Okay. Thank Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. Uh, Diana, please go ahead. All right. Thank you. Okay, I have a bit of a challenge, uh, which to some extent is affecting. Uh, performance and that has to be with the procurement uh, function and lately there was mm -hmm. uh, a bit of uh, review and restructuring in the procurement process so even if we think we are on a transition period but it is greatly affecting a uh, service delivery because we rely on uh, the procurement unit 
for supply of, uh, for example, inventory of space and also for some services. There is a directive from uh, management that all procurement of goods and services must pass through the procurement unit. In the past, we had the bridge of uh, dealing directly, sometimes when we have emergencies. But with the new uh, uh, directive, everything has to go through procurement and there's a tender process in place, which sometimes does not really support uh, maybe for issues that are urgent. So that is a bit of a problem for us for now. And I'm thinking yeah. of how we can uh, communicate these challenges to management. Okay. You see, um, every time there's a, a process in place to control us as FMs, don't, don't try to wrap your head about how to get management to suspend the process or reduce the rigors of the process to let us get by, right? No, don't seek step out of process for any reason. It makes us look suspicious. That's exactly how we are perceived. If we start trying to say, oh, well, uh, the process is a bit cumbersome and there are some things we need in a hurry, um, we need to get it. Um, let's go back to how it was when we can engage for the little things we used to buy. No, for management to say everything should go through procurement, it's a control they are putting in place. Do not, do not find yourself at that point where you're convincing yourself that by passing, stepping down that process, getting approval for step out of that process is a good thing. It is never a good thing, right? So what you can do, one is, support the process, support procurement people by doing your own procurement well. For example, scope what you require, write detailed specifications that includes specifications for the things you want procurement to do, pre-qualification for which kind of vendors or suppliers can deliver it, give your own uh, criteria, and evaluation, build evaluation criteria as well. How will procurement know who has supplied the best option to meet my needs? If you do proper scoping and specification, uh, 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 proper uh, uh, contractor or vendor selection criteria from your own expertise and proper bid evaluation criteria, and you submit this in the request to procurement, you have solved procurement issues by half. They will not have to do any of those things again. Their job would just be to throw those papers out to vendors, get your job in, and it will be faster, right? So support the process by doing most of the procurement work yourself. Every time you send a procurement request for maybe a TV in the conference room, oh, please give us 55-inch color TV for display in the conference room. You have abdicated the procurement requirements. There are at least 15 line items to describe the kind of TV you are looking for. Put those descriptions down carefully and say, this particular uh, spec of TV, um, it is preferable that you look out to distributors, original OEM reps like this, 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 who are in this, that, 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 right? Or um, uh, companies that have supplied such in the past, that have been trading this business directly for a long time, or that actually directly stock them. You are guiding procurement into where to get it from, not to get it from. Uh, uh, any uh, Tom, Dick, and Harry. And finally, you are saying, if this thing actually coming, this is a checklist for uh, certifying that this is the one I want, and this is the best bid or best value for that. I have solved procurement job uh, greatly, and I put that in. So do not, do not by any chance, seek a step out of process when it comes to procurement. We look suspicious. Support the procurement process. And finally, finally, Understand lead times for approval and proactively throw in your request well in advance of that lead time. An FM that knows that he has 5,000 liters as tank uh, uh, size and he consumed 4,000 liters in two weeks. The turnaround time from request to approval to delivery is four weeks, for example. 
based on how things have gone bad recently. It now takes four weeks instead of one week before to get approval. It means that the day this is delivered, that's the day I order the next diesel. Because it is four weeks to use up my 5,000 liters, it is four weeks to turn around the process of the paperwork. It's not for me to wait until it is two weeks into it, half tank, apply, and start to try to joke the system to ask for step out or speed up or no, 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 don't be in that situation. Instead, be proactive and push things in advance. All right, all right. Uh, thank you, sir. I think you're, to a large extent, I have been uh, proactive in uh, supporting the the procurement uh, unit. And uh, in fact, I'm, uh, I have uh, volunteered most of my time to be an evaluator of <laughs> just to give them the food. But uh, also another another challenge is also they are also focused to a large extent on prizes. Yes. And uh, of recent, I see that that is not really giving us value. I give an example. Uh, there is a, a, a work that was given out to a vendor for road maintenance. And unfortunately, with the new system, we do not have privilege to see what the, the commercials are, to know what anybody is quoting for. So for example, you see a sheet of zinc, for example, uh, of roofing sheet that should be maybe in the neighborhood of eight to 9,000 per square meter, and uh, somebody is offering for 4,000, and they're still going ahead to say supply. And we get to a point where the person is supposed to mobilize the site, is coming to say uh, that price is no longer attainable. We begin to see a lot of issues like this, and uh, it's a bit challenging for us. So, so the first principle here, um, Diana, is that the lowest price is the best price after you have specified correctly. So if I ask a vendor, go and give me a roofing sheet, how much per square meter will you give me roofing sheets? If he says it's 1,000 Naira, whatever roofing sheet he can give me for 1,000 Naira is what I've asked for. I cannot complain. But if I tell him I want 0.55 mm gauge aluminum long span roofing sheet, oven baked color coating, certain widths and certain lengths per item, preferably so so and so type of rolling mill, aluminum rolling mill, because there are different types of rolling mills. If I do that specification and he reads it, he will then not tell me he has one for 1,000 Naira. Because he knows that he'll be wasting his time. The day he brings that one that is not exactly what I specified, what do I do? I turn it down. Suddenly he's no longer available. And when he's no longer available, he cannot do the job again. What do I do? I cancel the job and give it to the one who bid there 9,000, the next person online. Again, that person is also guided by my specification. Do not, please do not fight against lowest bidder. Control the process of getting the lowest bid through proper specification. As detailed as you can get, get a checklist that you issue out with that certification to the contractor to say, what you are bringing to us before you drop it for us, does it mean this line item, check, sign? Does it mean this one, check, sign? Does it mean this one, check, sign? When the guy reads it like this twice, he will take his thing back without even coming back to deliver them to your site. So control from the in inside. Whenever you have done that control through proper specification, my dear, the lowest price should always win. Thank you much. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, thank you. Away, go ahead. Let's hear you. Hello. Yes, sir. I I have uh, an observation to what Mr. Diana just said. Okay. Actually, in our organization, we have this procurement policy in which everything that has to do with contract supply goes through our procurement department. Sure. So and we have this uh, policy. 
that any any contract above five million naira should go to tender board process. And fortunately, I'm one of the member of the uh, tender board process. There is this one contract. What I before I say this exactly this example. What I'm trying to say, even if you use everything as a facility uh, manager, you tell them your specifications and all that. At the end, if that work should have a little bit of uh, uh, inequality, you will still be blamed. And this takes me to this example I was about to, uh, to cite now. Then we wanted to do our one of, of our anger flooring. So what we decided to use epoxy. So we called the epoxy vendors, all of them quoted, and we have these uh, uh, vendors that are close to each other. One was 80 million, the other one was 20, 24 million. So when they were uh, both discussing about the epoxy, because we had to interview them in lengthy interview. So one, I said, he has done it for hangars. And this particular aircraft, uh, hangars uh, designed for this, uh, for a particular aircraft. Why the other said, he has never uh, done it for aircraft, but just for uh, these heavy trucks and others. So he was quoting a similar, the, one, the man that did for uh, aircraft said, he can't do it more than 24 million. So there, were now, there was this contemplation uh, between the two because the one of 24 million said, don't worry, keep half of my money. Then after one month, you confirm my job, then give me my balance. Even if you are not still confused, share the balance to two. Then after six, after six months, they pay me all. The other, why the other said he needed uh, most of the money because uh, so for him to mobilize to site. So the MD and his CFO called my, my manager, my facility manager, and said, which contractor do you want? The man was saying, my guy told him that, he won the one that has done for Angus, not the one that has done for Fedas, but the procurement department, the internal audit, and the financial people. They say, ah, how do we justify the change of six million? Since this man wants to do uh, the same thing, long, long, long have you, they have ordered the contract to the 80 million vendor, and the work was done. And what he, when they were talking about the time, when the technical people were talking about the time, so he invented this epoxy motor. So instead of using concrete, we used epoxy mortar. No one complained about it. In, uh, after one, one year, eight months, this thing started cracking. Everybody was blaming facility. They don't know what they are doing. You see these things? You see those things? They never knew what we went to do in the tender process. How many people will you call? And when, when, my, when we were talking about this thing at the tender board meeting, no one was supporting us because they, this, this is just like waste of six million. It's just like waste of six million. So what Mr. Viana is saying, sometimes the tender board, uh, the procurement policy doesn't favor. If you are against it, you'll be, uh, you'll be uh, everybody will say, yeah, this is sabotage, it's sabotage. When we are telling them the quality, they will still agree. So I don't know, maybe we uh, will continue accepting the blame or since you say we shouldn't debate the procurement policy, maybe we start, we continue accepting the blame because at the end, we will, we will still be blamed for the misfortune of that project. Of the, uh, well, you should be blamed you will be blamed 100% and squarely. And let me tell you where the failure point happened. The failure okay, point man. happened during execution. You aspiring a job where the man was supposed to use concrete. The moment yeah. the man decided to use that epoxy mortar, you freeze the job, stop. If you're not gonna use concrete, you can't progress. That is the point where you control that specification. Because there are just two points of control you have. One is right specification, exactly what you want. Contractors should not be specifying such things to you. In fact, if you don't know, let me give you a shortcut. If you don't know how to get specifications, let the contractors write their own proposal. Read all the proposals and do more research and come up with your own final specification. Issue it back to all of them to quote. When they do quote, pick the lowest one. But at the second point of control during execution, you put your foot down, okay? That material, you're not using it here. Take it away. It's concrete or nothing. Are you hearing me? So there's nothing like, oh, they gave it to 18 million. That's why it failed. That's not why it failed. Why it failed is that you did not use your second point of control, which is execution. No variation. Specification is specification. End of story. Okay? Yes, sir. When he, when he introduced the epoxy motor, the management were in support. I said, okay, this one, when the man was saying, if you use concrete, it will take 28 days for the concrete to heal. 
And he said he has a pulse motor. And the pulse motor will just take three days. So they were considering the time because some of our aircraft are on the ramp and they have to be in the hangar for them to carry on maintenance. So we were like, let him go ahead, let him go ahead. And if you stop them that time, they will come in and sabotage. You were set up point, and you took the bait. <laughs> So that was that we are. So, uh, uh, it's, it's a it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a Nigerian team. So I, I I asked the same question uh, in our last class uh, that all of this our learning is he an Oyibo team because from all of the the classes I am seeing that. They don't teach you that. What I'm teaching is hundred percent Nigeria. No, no, <laughs> sir. Okay, yes, I I agree. It's because we don't really have process. So. Come to what Mr. Vianana said. Every yeah. procurement has a process. And I believe yeah. every procurement of anything starts with the technical department, which is Mr. Vianana in this case, or the facility yeah. people. Yeah. So, and there is a purchase request, which states all your technical evaluation. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and the supplier is supposed to even first quote a technical um, quotation before the commercial. Yes. Which is supposed to go back to Mr. Vianana, not the procurement mm -hmm. department. Yes, yes. Maybe through the procurement department. Mm -hmm. Then they will now evaluate and say, yes, this guy will meet up with our yes. specification. Yes. You can supply. Then they go back to the purchasing and say, purchase and see the three guys that are able to supply our specification. Mm -hmm. But if there is no politics in it inside the procurement department, because I work with the procurement, if there is no politics, they may first think Mr. Vianana is bringing his three friends as the best. They may be looking out to get money from these three best and sabotage the process in a way. But Mr. Vianana being an honest person should wait for any of the three that is coming with his specification. And if they decide to choose another person, they should so give the person that same specification and let him talk to him. Procurement, our procurement vice president used to tell us that you are the best friend, that is the technical people and the procurement people. You are the best friend to the suppliers. You can even go to their houses so that you will know them in and out. When they lie to you, you will know because there is time to deliver every project. You don't say like what the management is doing to Mr. Where well, they are right. They want to deliver a project so that they will not enter into liquidated damages. So they want something that is fast. That is why most suppliers, when they are doing their bid, they come, they give you two weeks of delivery. And they know in their mind that that thing will not come in two weeks. But they know after the commercials, what you consider next is delivery. So they will tell you, my, I can do it in two weeks, whether the thing will be mm -hmm. inferior or not. Mm -hmm. Then another thing, sir, for mm -hmm. Mr. Dianana, because of this, uh, the issue he mentioned about uh, the new process, when the supplier will come to delay their work, I think it should raise up um, an issue of a frame agreement, which is what else. There should be a frame agreement for the list of the things that you are using that are like um, um, inventories, uh, what we call consumables. So that once they give to one company that you are the winner of these things, anytime they can always make requests. They don't have to go through procurement process. I like that. Frame agreement. I like that. Is I the like best way practice. to get your that's things done. Yes. Yes, that's that is what practice. we do. It's also it's called a blanket PO. You can use that. It's blanket, that's yes. A blanket one, PO. You can get other exactly, sir. Yeah, that's a good one. Exactly, sir. That, that's right. that's I yes. just said yes. the answer. That, that was fantastic. Okay, so so um uh what I teach is best practices. Please try them out. Try them out. You might think that there are politics around you, there are systemic issues, there are certain uh, unspoken uh, nuances around you. Do your job, be as detailed as possible, be as transparent as possible. Behave as if you did not notice any of those. And when it's time to put your foot down to say, this is the specification I want, please be bold enough to do it at that point. Most things will give way if you do your job right, and that is the truth. It may not give way the first time you take a position, but over time, they understand your position. My man says, I want the concrete fast, for example. Contrario says, well, this country will not be fast. There are other ways to 
do something else that will be fast. But I'm the FM. I'm concerned that this should also last. Not fast today, save two weeks today, and then this thing will crack, not do five years later. What about hard setting, fast setting concrete? There are solutions around it. What's the worst thing that can happen? Management, he needs to use concrete. It takes the next 21 days to cure. But I know there is a 48 hour curing concrete in the market. Can we switch to that concrete? Even if you have to go to Ready Mix with Lafarge or Dangote and say, give me curing a concrete that will cure in 48 hours. They know how to make that concrete and give you the cubic meters you need to do your project. After all, they cast concrete into the ocean, pour it inside there to set inside water, don't they? And they build a, a, a whole uh, bridge on top. Did that concrete not set inside the water? So there are solutions to everything. We just need to open our mind to exactly what we want and then insist that we try multiple options to get around it. If you allow the shortcuts, 18 months later, it breaks. You are still at fault, that's my point. So even if you didn't do what I asked you to do now and you fell under the pressure of the system or the advisory that you were getting at that time, when the time comes and the pressure comes back to you say you have failed, say, oh, I learned my lesson. Next time, I'm going to use that lesson to make better decisions and move on. But to start fighting back and say, no, it's not my fault, it's their fault. Eh, hey, don't do that. <laughs> Own it, okay? <laughs> All right, thank you so much. That was a very um, fantastic um, discussion and thanks everybody who brought in uh, issues for, for us to learn from. Uh, this is exactly how uh, this program is going to add value to everybody. We all need to be bringing up issues all the time so that we can all learn from it, okay? I'm gonna share my screen now and we're gonna go straight into the lesson for today. Please confirm to me that you see my screen. Yes. Yes. Very good. Today we're yes, looking yes. at strategic facility planning. And strategic planning really is about the FM elevating his profession to a very, very strategic level. The FM not sitting down to say I'm a support service provider but getting involved in the core business of the organization that you support. If you are a strategic enabler of the success of an organization, you must be part of that organization's business. You are not an outsider who comes to uh, take their money to help them spend it. No, that's not what you are. What you are is someone who understands the business 100%, and every decision you make is based on that understanding. You are now fully aligned. I cannot provide services that can really be seen to be adding value to the organization. So that's what we're gonna be looking at in the strategy strategy planning. And we will start by talking about what I call the big picture. This is the strategy framework of your organization. And this is the strategy framework that you as an FM needs to apply to develop your own strategy. That's what we're gonna be doing um, uh, uh, in this lesson. The first level of your, of the strategy framework is called the strategic purpose level. This is the highest level of strategy. This is the level where the reason for the existence of your organization is defined. Every organization, whether profit-making or not profit-making, commercial, private, or public, has a set of customers. Those customers have requirements, they have preferences, they have needs and opportunities that you as a business or an organization is trying to set up to meet. So the first level of definition of your organization is who are our customers? What do they really want? How can we as an organization meet the requirements of these customers? 
That is the strategic purpose of your organization. The organization, every organization, the founders, the entrepreneurs, the, the directors who started the business, we create the strategic planning level, which we also call the corporate strategy. They come up with some vision, mission, values, culture, and strategic objectives. This is where what we as an organization represent is defined and broken down. This is where our understanding of the customer requirements is interpreted and we set up ourselves as the team that can meet that customer requirement. What then is the mission of an organization? The mission is how you get to that destination, which is your vision. So let me put this in context. The vision of an organization is how they want to be perceived. Their destination as an organization, whatever they want to achieve as their end goal, that is your vision. A vision is often defined by what you want to be. If you think back as to when you were in school, in primary school, and you had that mindset that I'm going to manage a company and be a managing director by the time I am 40 years old, for example, that is a vision. My vision in life is to become that, is to do that end goal, to achieve that end goal. The organizations will define that vision in terms of their customers. All organizations who know what they are doing should define their vision in terms of their customers. In essence, how do you want your customers to see you? How do you want your customers to perceive you? What is the end goal of your customer? You pitching into the end goal of the customer is your vision as a business. Your mission then becomes the milestones or steps you will take to arrive at your vision. That's why vision statements often reflect things like, we will do this, we will do that. If your vision statement is, we will be this, we will be that, your mission statement is, we will do this, we will do that. What we will do should align with what we want to be. So your mission is the path the steps, the milestones that lead you to your vision. And then your values. What are the values of an organization? Those are the things that are identified and written down as mantras, as principles to live by, as, as, as uh, you, know, uh, you know, key words that drive the way we should think and act and take decisions. Those are our values. But values are the things that are actually written down and you know, taught and discussed and agreed to and say, these are going to be our values. We are going to be a customer-focused organization. We will use leverage technology to be at the cutting edge of innovation. We will be honest in all that we do. We will be, you know, all of those things that drives us are our values. Now, values are the things we identify, that we espouse to, that we write down, that we say we will be and we will do. But then, culture are the things, the way we behave, the way we think, and the way we do things, if it aligns with the values, then we say we have a high performance culture, which means we say we will be like this, we'll act like this, and we are actually like that. For example, an open door policy. First names, we're gonna be friendly in this organization. We're gonna be honest with each other in telling other, each other the truth. That's what we say. Those are our values. But what is the reality on ground? Do we have a blame game culture? Do we have a who we will chew culture? Do we have who is wrong, who is right? Do we have who is senior taking his position and saying, do you know who I am? 
a lot of things deviate from your values and you say the culture is negative. It's a low performing culture. Nobody ever defines culture. What you define are your values. What becomes your reality is your culture. So the organization has a set of mission, vision, mission. Vision is where we want to get to our final destination. Mission are the milestones and the steps we will take to get there. And values is how we will get there, our behaviors. If we have a high performance culture, our values will be what will be happening to us. We will be experiencing our values. But the organizations will have to come up with strategic objectives. These strategic objectives is like breaking down your mission into steps, day-to-day -day activities that you will perform, that you will do. Of course, at high level, because when you are at the strategy planning level, you are not really talking about day-to-day -day activities. You are talking about milestones. You are talking about um, um, uh, objectives, profitability targets, for example, performance satisfaction index targets, for example. All of those are high-level key performance indicators. You set them as a strategic objective. Everybody knows that if I'm contributing or adding value to this business, I'm contributing to one objective or the other. If you are in a business and you cannot report how you're contributing to a specific objective, then you are useless. You're not making and adding any value to that organization. So the strategic planning level, which is the corporate strategy, is to govern the entire organization. But that is not the end of strategy. Every business unit will have to create their own strategy. And one of the business units which you happen to belong to is the facility management organization or the FM business unit. See yourself just the way marketing and sales see themselves, production sees themselves, operations see themselves. The FM function is not going to produce a strategic uh, uh, a document or a plan that aligns only with the corporate strategy. Because the corporate strategy cannot be implemented except the work, the business unit that's succeeding. Your job as an FM is to have double alignment, an alignment with the corporate strategy, an alignment with all the business unit strategy. In essence, what does this mean? It means that you understand the organization, the EDs and MDs and their thinking, right? But all of their thinking is being interpreted by all the business units who are going to make it happen. You, as a strategic enabler, must ensure that you have plans that incorporate the plans of all the other business units. You will not be the one sitting down and waiting for HR to come and tell you we are going to be hiring next month. Provide a place where they're going to sit. Or operations saying, oh, we're bringing a new production uh, uh, plant. We're going to be producing double our current capacity. You need to ramp up your water uh, 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 production and electricity uh, availability uh, because we're going to be producing more. You don't wait. You take up your strategy planning to that level where you fully understand what's going to happen in all the business units in the next two to five years. You are in a forecasting predictive mode when doing strategy planning. And we're going to look at the model for strategy planning as we move on in this class. But as an FM, you develop a portfolio plan, which we also call the strategic facility plan. That's a portfolio plan. It is a document that takes decision on high level items concerning all of your sites. And then you develop a real estate master plan. Real estate master plans are focused on each location. How will this location develop and progress over time? In terms of physical structure, is it a bungalow that will turn into uh, a duplex or uh, multiple floors later? In terms of services, is it 
Are we going to ramp up services and provide more services in the future? Are we going to have more people work in this location? How are you going to serve them? What's traffic going to be like here in the next two to five years? What's the uh, 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 welfare uh, services we should have in place to deal with the influx of more staff and more uh, uh, individuals coming into this place? To be an office that has just management and management staff coming in, later being converted into an office that has marketing and all the public coming to have uh, a meeting with the marketing team. You have to have a master plan for each location. It's more like an architectural engineering plan that takes care of how you close the gap between what this facility is providing right now versus what you should be providing in the next few years based on trends with your business. That comes out of understanding the various business units. So, what if I go to HR and the, the HR manager just tell me to, 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 to get lost? What's my business coming to ask them whether they're going to hire more or whether they're going to uh, 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 expand or contract, right? That would be easy to do if I have not been seen or known as a strategic thinker or person or personnel. If I come to the HR manager and say, in the last three years, this is the total headcount we've had in this building. It's gone up from 40 to 50, and now we have seven people in this building. If I use that to plot, it looks like in the next five years, we'll be 120 people in this building. And I'm trying to create my plans to ensure that we're able to meet those kind of numbers. What do you think are the likely numbers for next year, next year, next three years? That HR manager will look at you deeply and give you information. You have come from the standpoint of this little, this little bit I know, and this is what I've been able to do with the data that I have. What more can you chip in for me to help you succeed? That's what brings you into that meeting. That's the conversation you bring to the business units. They will cooperate with you 100%. Everything they are doing, they will let you know. So you can always have provisions for them to get what they want. At a practical level, you are providing your operations and maintenance. Your operations plan, your maintenance plan, your budgets, design and construction for new renovations and new projects. If you have ever found yourself doing any of these things, which is more like your bread and butter as an FM, and you have never in the past created a strategic plan, something is amiss, and that needs to change. Don't think about the plan being too bogus. Just have outlines of how you perceive your organization moving. Outline of how you want to move your facilities to meet the needs of the organization as it moves on. That's strategic planning. So if I'm creating an annual budget, for example, or putting an operations or maintenance contract in place, I am doing this based on the understanding I already have about the strategy I already have in place. That's why it's important to do approval for your strategy. Get senior management to review your facility management strategy. Let them have their inputs. In fact, the moment you start doing facility management strategy, facility plan, right? EDs that used to come up with the plans in the past We'll be happy that you are supporting and creating that relief for them. They will no longer end up with the thoughts that they have to figure out all the issues around facility strategic planning and bring you in only at the end. Because what we are suffering today is that FMs are being brought in at the end of all projects. So we want to carry the monkeys, things that have not been well thought through from the FM standpoint, right? Now, they see you as thinking strategically and doing things strategically. They want to bring you on board early enough. They want to bring you on board. And this is exactly where we all want to get to as facility managers. So, we, once you have your tactical plans, you need to start executing. Contract in place. 
you develop uh, uh, vitro style, you develop cleaning procedures and so on and so forth, maintenance step-by-step -step, uh, uh, procedures for doing maintenance, you are implementing, you are generating a lot of uh, um, tools and templates for getting the job done. After, as you are doing this execution, you are also generating reports. Your reports should help you measure performance. How am I doing relative to my budget? How am I doing to my maintenance plans and operations plan? If they truly align with your strategy, then you will be able to tell yourself whether you are doing well or not from your performance report. And that information is fed back into the loop of strategic thinking to say, is my strategy right? My strategic strategy plan and my master plan, do they closely align with the expectation of my business units? Do they closely align with the expectation of my organization? Are they in harmony with what the organization is telling me to do? If yes, my execution from practical planning to execution, is it effective? Is it giving me the results I need? Because if my strategy is right, then I should be getting, you know, successes with my execution. If my strategy is right and I'm not getting successes from my execution, I might now need to tweak my execution. It's possible you have too few vendors. So every time you try to bid out, you are in the you are stuck in the, uh, you know in the trap of those few vendors manipulating your processes. So you cannot meet your cost ambition, for example. You can't meet your quality or scope ambitions, for example. You might think, oh well, maybe I should open up my vendor pool and get more vendors in. Right? So all of the changes that you'll be considering at this level is because you are doing measurements of the performance through reporting and you are validating strategy on an ongoing level. So this is a cycle where validation strategy can go back to any level and rethink the process all the way down. So it's very strategic planning. Um, it's you know a tool for the FM to ambition its future by linking its purpose to the strategy of the entire organization, and then developing goals, objectives, and action plan action plans to achieve that future. My organization is going this way. I should also be going that way. If this is how my organization is going, and this is what the organization's uh, goals and objectives are. How will I create objectives that will align with that of my organization? That's exactly what I'm trying to do with strategic strategic planning. Go through a four-step process. I would like to take a little break and come back and discuss the four-step process for strategic strategic planning. Five minutes break, please. Thank you. We we'll talked about the mission, vision, values and strategic objective, which is the organization goals. The FM cannot be a stranger to the organization, must learn all of these things. Invite them and make them a part of you. you. Must learn financial performance of the organization. Is my organization profitable? Are we improving in our finances? Are we making more money? Are we being old as a business? You know, sometimes an FM will say, oh, well, uh, uh, I'm not private to such information. This information with senior management, they won't let us know. The spending pattern in your organization will give you a hint. The kind of things the organization does with money will give you a hint. The kind of people the organization hires, the kind of contracts that are awarded will tell you that we either have money or we don't. If you're a production facility, it's a service rendering organization, you will get enough sense that we are making more business or we are not. If you just show enough concern about the business. For many organizations, they have the annual uh, reports, which we call the audited accounts, and other reports they issue out. Some of these reports are available to the public. Some have them in their 
magazines, news magazines, industry magazines. Some have them in different, you know, publications, even online on their websites. So if an FM needs to know how our mission is performing, how we are doing, you will know. Take your headcounts, for example. How many were we in 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019? Even if HR does not give you any numbers, you are the facility manager now. Won't you know people that come in and people that go out as staff? You get a sense. Your footfalls. A mall that 3,000 people comes in every hour that no longer sees up to 500 people per hour. Will the FM not know the handwriting of the world, what trend, what direction this business is going now? You will know. There will always be indications that will tell you whether things are OK or not. For some of you, you will see it in the, in the way salaries are paid. Delayed salaries, half salary with promises, and so on. We will tell you that there is difficulty around, isn't it? When they say boom, you also feel the sense of a boom. Sometimes it's just an indicator of something happening in macroeconomics that gives you an, a, a sense that it's not well or it's well. For example, the company imports most of its inputs for its production. It pays in dollars. And dollar just rose from 400 Naira to 550 Naira. That's a 30% additional cost to doing business. Will addition raise this cost immediately? Most likely not. Most addition do not have that level of price elasticity to make their price change immediately. So it costs change. So there'll be a law, there'll be a time when there's no money to do what we want to do. So the FM know this. Are you burying your head in the sand or are you opening your eyes and your ears and getting information through feelers and formal settings to know whether the mission is doing well or not. Move on to the next stage, analysis. Use analytical techniques, such as SWOT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Scan, which is like uh, environmental uh, assessment of what your competitors are doing. Scenario planning, where you create different scenarios, like simulating which direction the company is going based on different things that might happen, and different types of you know, uh, 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 information that you can put together to create analysis. At the onset, these analysis will be for you to harness, coordinate, systematically, Process the information you have gathered about your organization in the understanding phase. Because these are the things that will fit into the next stage, which is the planning stage, where you develop plans that meet the long range needs of the organization. You review these plans annually and update periodically. Your plans will be accepted, will be approved, will be supported by senior management if they are in alignment. And it can only be in alignment with corporate strategy if you have used uh, understanding tools to understand corporate strategy. Don't come analysis to come up with your, for example, gap analysis. Where are we now? Where should we be? Whatever plans you come up with after doing this analysis will often align with what management wants. And then you move to the process, the step of acting. Take actions as planned and implement. Incorporated feedback into the next plan or project to provide continuous improvements. And you're creating plans. Your plans cannot sit as planned. The practical level, 
you have to execute these plans. You have to put contracts in place and you have to put them into budgets and so on and so forth. So you can provide that value that you have planned into your strategic planning. So we'll take these processes, these steps in the process of strategic planning one by one. Your strategic facility plan identifies the type, quantity, and location of spaces needed by the organization. What are the various people doing in the organization today? What do they want to achieve? What kind of spaces do they need? In-depth analysis of the existing facilities. You as you drawings, you know where every space is. You know what every space is being used for in the site plan, the floor, floor drawings, floor plans. You have your asset register. You have a condition assessment that gives you a report of all the conditions of every asset. And you know this thing. That's an in-depth analysis of an existing facility. Don't forget that you cannot make a plan to take you from point A to point B if you don't already know what point A and point B are. Point A is where you are, fully understood by you. I have so, so square meters, I have so many number of people, and I provide electricity, I provide water, I provide ABC. Now, this is my current situation. These are the documents that show what I'm currently managing. But because I'm trying to understand the organization's future and support and enable that future, I also need to have a plan. That's where the gap analysis comes. This is where we are as a business. This is where we are as a department for FM. The business, this is where we are likely going to be in three to five years. And this is where we will be as an FM, which is integral to that new position. Okay. Achievable and affordable plan to meet the mission's needs. Using the organizational business plan, the difference to be identified between the current situation and analyzed need. But I like to make you your, your, your scenarios and your gap analysis and all of those other analysis. Now is the time to say, what can we do to move us from point A to point B? That is what you are doing in understanding. You are understanding the difference between point A and point B for your organization. Okay. Study the current real estate assets using gather data such as lease and ownership data. How many buildings do we have that are owned? How many buildings do we have that we rented? Building assessments. This is where you look at the condition of all of your buildings one by one. You can compare them using SCI that like we discussed today. Square footages for various departments and different functions and different categories of staff and what they do with those square footage. You have to have a sense of how space is being utilized If you understand how space is being utilized, you can come up with visualization standards. And what are these? These are, uh, uh, you know, uh, policies that help define who gets what kind of space for what kind of function in the organization. Explore the various business goals of each unit in the business to define future space and real estate needs based on overall corporate goals. This is the point I stressed a lot a while ago. You must explore the various business goals of each unit in the business. You can sit in your office and get information on the strategy and goals of HRO, of IT, of finance. You cannot do that. Administrative services, expecting staffing changes, first staffing changing, and potential new technologies. Anticipate what services are we providing today, which ones are going to be likely in a few years' time. Oh, well, we have uh, more of young ladies getting married in a few years' time, there will be babies, and we need to have a crutch. That is what we are talking about the anticipate services. Expected staffing changes. They're going to be 
that increases or decreases? Are we going to be using internships to get fresh graduates and create a, a we are going to have a, a graduate training program? How am I going to cater for that? Is there a policy that's coming that's going to make us able to work remotely in the next few years? How is that going to affect our physical assets? When we say FM should predict future headcount, the information comes from the past. So if you imagine a facility, I don't even have an idea how many people are currently sitting in that facility today. You cannot be talking strategy planning tomorrow because you cannot use it. You cannot have the data with which you are going to predict future headcount. Demographics, sex and age and experience of the various work, workforce category. How they use space, what kind of maintenance requirements and capital investment operating costs are my supposed to anticipate in the future. And FM's job is not to just sit down and react to things. You anticipate things. You work towards achieving things. Scenario planning is the is a systematic way of um, simulating what will happen. Because when you want to create a plan, oh, I want to create a two year to five years plan, you are thinking, how do I know what's going to happen? I gave you a hint. Use historical data and plots or projects. That still won't give you everything. Because certain changes might happen that may make those projections unrealistic or untenable. How can you anticipate those, those changes now by simulating it? Oh, well, our current MD is a Scottish, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's from the UK. What's the likelihood that we're going to have another white MD in two years' time when his tenure expires? If a black MD, one of us, is picked, what would this operation look like? If the position is advertised and an MD is picked from outside, what does the operation look like? Those are scenarios. You can start to external internal changes that might influence the organization. And for each change, discuss the best case, the worst case, and the most likely. Suggest financial strategies in each of the three scenarios to respond to each change. Propose strategies that must be addressed in order to respond to possible external change. And the most likely external changes to affect the decision over the next three to five years, for example, and identify the most reasonable strategies the decision can undertake to respond to these changes. If you can't simulate potential changes. You can also simulate potential measures or directions company can go. It's a case of Moses and Pharaoh's dream. So I can interpret what the Pharaoh has dreamt about. And the Pharaoh says, okay, you can interpret it. Who is there that's better than you to prepare us? You are the one that was able to predict external change that is going to affect us as a country. So you be the chief governor and implement this for all these years. That's exactly what we're talking about here. Systematic layout planning, a document that presents information in layout formats. For example, a flow chart will show how an operation process moves from one stage to another stage to another stage. Take the simple process of ordering materials or calling for a job to be done. Your facility users should not be confused. They should not have multiple ways of reaching the FM department. They'll have one reliable way of reaching the FM department with the information that they need or the information that they have about the needs that they want to satisfy. All kinds of information can be presented in a layout, a layout format. Footage, square footage requirements, for example, 
you can say this is IT department. How many people are there? What is the standard for this type of uh, uh, department? How many people, how many square meters should we give them? If you have IT, you have accounting, you have marketing, you have operations, you have you know strategy and so on. As department or business unit, you want to be able to create a dashboard that shows how many of them right now, how many square meters are they managing right now, how many square meters per person is the average right now. Because when the chips are down and they want to expand, they will often ask you to tell management whether to expand or to bring them into the same space and find a way to fit them into the space. If you don't know the standard for square footage for each person, for example, you might end up with a few departments that have surplus space. That if they are moved around and tweaked around a little bit, we can accommodate all the people we are trying to hire. Okay. So block plan layouts, talking about if you have a high rise, um, you know, how people are going to be, how spaces are going to relate to each other, whether high rise or bungalow. Um, and then an equipment layout, which is more like your site plan or your, your floor plans with the equipment indicated where they should be. So the multi layout planning is about being able to create spreadsheets, flow charts, um, any document that gives you a clear picture of whatever you want to uh, review. And then it's SWOT analysis. You analyze the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats using business objectives to identify both internal and external factors that are either favorable or unfavorable to achieving that objective. So for every strategic objective, you ask, what are strengths? What are the attributes of our organization that helps us, that will help us achieve this objective? And describe how they can be leveraged. Weaknesses are attributes of the organization harmful to achieving the objective. How can they be minimized or neutralized? Opportunities are external conditions helpful to achieving the objective. And threats are external conditions that are harmful to achieving the objective. So you are looking at your organization and saying, what are we good at? Our strengths. What are we bad at? What's frustrating us from inside? Our weakness. What is out there that can stop us? Your threats. What is out there that we can leverage as an opportunity to, to go fast or go bigger? Our opportunities. That's what SWOT analysis is. For an effort to be able to develop SWOT analysis that is effective in giving you some insight about the organization, it means you've committed yourself to researching about the organization and getting involved in how the organization is run. So the planning proper. A plan in its simplest format is answers to a series of questions. Before thinking through anything, you write down questions and you provide answers to them. You have created a plan. It documents the primary objective to be addressed, which is the gap in the spending facility plan. Evaluate sites, zones, cost, labor, competition, and all factors for success. This is at the master plan level, which is the uh, site level. Financial and, and risk analysis, analysis to focus on finding the maximum value is a more um, uh, strategic um, uh, work to be done. Because every time you create a project or come up with an initiative, funds will be released, funds will be spent. What are the risks that this money to be spent? Are we not going to get the value you promised? And then don't come with without alternatives. Every time you make a plan for anything, make sure that it is not a one solution uh, proposal. I want us to achieve ABC using DEF. That is not what we're talking about here. To achieve ABC, we can use D, we can use E, we can use F. Use G, but I'm recommending G or F 
or I'm accommodating C. Why? Because of the following reasons. That's basically what you're doing. Evaluate sites, zoning, cost, labor, competition, and all factors critical for success. Conduct financial and risk analysis to focus on finding the maximum value. Develop alternatives to recommendations and priorities. Develop a process for marketing the recommended strategic plan to gain management approval. And this is important. If you've made efforts to create a strategic plan, get management to sign up on it. That becomes a tool for implementing your future budget. And then you have a budget to implement and you cite that pre previously approved strategy, you get a lot in terms of support. You seem to be knowing what you are doing. So you get approval. Your strategy is approved and then the other tactical plans will become easy to approve. You can see that in the way our government runs. The executive will prepare a document, a strategic document called a medium term economic framework. It tells what the strategy of the government is, uh, projects that they need to implement in the next few years, and how they're going to fund the government. They have to bring that first to the National Assembly to get approval on. Those guys look at it, strategy is fine, we can afford it, we can afford it, we have to borrow, the borrowing plan is part of it, and so on and so forth. Once they sign off on it, when you now bring the budget for next year, it is easier for them to deal with. So the first thing they're going to check is, have you followed the framework that we approved for you? In developing next year's budget. So even if you are going to revise this framework on a yearly basis, it will always address issues of multiple years. Then your budget will always come after the MTF has come and gone. That's the exactly what we're talking about here. You create a strategy plan and you get management to sign off on it, and it is possible that you will get you know quicker passage of your budget. Okay. What are the key outputs of the strategic facility planning process? You have your strategic facility plan, your master plan, and then the annual facility plan, which we refer to as the approved budget or generically, generically as your tactical plan. So let's look at what these two plans, the strategic facility plan and the facility master plan, what they will contain. The strategic facility plan, a statement of facility objectives, risk analysis of options, sustainability analysis, sources and uses of funds, operating expenses analysis, financial analysis like ROI, return on investments, net present value, uh, MPV, internal rate of returns, IRRO, and payback period analysis. These are all analysis that helps to convey your message to management. Lifestyle cost analysis, whole life cost analysis, cost benefit rating of alternatives and recommendations with clearly stated assumptions. If you look at this, there are high level, there are high level uh, decisions that need to be taken regarding your facility portfolio. And these decisions will guide site development at every site. Take a look at the master plan, which I always call the site plan. Your long-term site plan is your master plan, your facility master plan. It addresses issues as well such as zoning, regulation, covenant assessment. If you're going to build your head office in a certain street in Ikoi today, what is that street zone that is a residential zone, is it an industrial zone, is it a commercial zone? This needs to be 
carry it in your master plan. So your master plan basically will ask the question, what zone is this site located in? What can we use this site for? The standards and benchmark description, how are sites or offices going to be distributed? What kind of positions will have what kind of spaces? A program of space use, workflow analysis, engineering assessments and plan, block feet of parking plan. The block plan is like a bubble diagram, how people relate to themselves. So how does IT relate to marketing, to uh, front desk, to HRO, so that if they are put beside each other, you don't want to create an unnecessary friction in their flow of activities to each other. Concept site plan or campus plan, architectural image concept, long-term maintenance plan, construction estimate, phasing or sequencing plan, which is the sequence of project. All of these items are site-based. They are all going to be subordinated to the strategic facility plan. So when I'm doing my block fit and starting plans, I'm doing my uh, uh, workflow plan analysis, I'm doing my program of space use, I'm always keeping my eyes on the strategic facility plan. I should not do anything in the, in the master plan that derails from what the strategic facility plan is trying to achieve. And then of course I implement the SFP um, by developing certain projects to either create new space, provide new services, alter or configure space or alter or configure my services. It is at the acting stage that I'm now beginning to implement what has happened or what we have agreed on or signed off at the strategic planning. A facility will typically go through this process, planning, design, construction, testing, commissioning, handover into facility management. And we have seen situations where the FM comes in just at the time it says it's going into facility management. But when we want to place an argument for getting the FM in at an earlier stage, what is the FM's involvement? What should the FM be doing at every stage? That is a good question. At the planning stage, the FM has made input. In fact, the FM makes an input in every stage until we get to the facility management stage because it's not the one staring each of those stages. And because it's not the one staring each of those stages, it provides input into the process. The primary driver at the planning stage is planning, and planning is made up of the owner and other stakeholders who make decisions like how big we should build, what should we build for, what kind of property should we build, who should we sell with this property. They make those decisions. They come out with a brief that goes into the design. The architects come together and look at this brief and say, okay, we want to provide for 100 rooms, for example, it's a hotel. I want to provide for a large theater. For example, it's a lecture, um, it's an organization that does um, education like a university. What the design team does is to take the planning document or the brief and start creating sketches. The FM should be on ground to provide guidance, ideas, solutions to ensure that the design does not become generic, transferring all the problems we've been expressing before in past years into the project again. For example, you probably have a mall that has been built and the mall does not have a changing room, a shower, an artisan area. You just have one small office for the FM manager. What do you expect? People will meal around. They will dry their coveralls on AC grill. A lot of things will happen that will now start making us ask, what did we do? What could we have done to provide these people space to do their work and to be comfortable? Because the FM did not put any input, any uh, uh, you know commitments or put any uh, supports or ideas into the plan uh, designing uh, stage. 
there are lots of maintainability issues that the FM would deal with on sites that have been designed into your facility. For example, a building core shaft. You know where that shaft is, where you have all of the services running through top to bottom in a high rise building. Not being ventilated and sweating over time, over the years, it's become a, a, a means of provide, that provides a, a flooding inside the building core. You need to think about it. You, you, you see a design and you're carried away without thinking about how meters are going to be installed, how the cabling should support individual and independent metering for each client so you can distribute proper bills or they use prepared meters in their locations to pay their bills correctly. After you have built, you now start wondering about those are the things that should go into design. I was in a high rise once where if a bathroom on any floor has a problem, they will go and isolate every bathroom on that stack. That's the only way they can fix that problem. Imagine if you have to fix one bathroom a day or multiple issues with the bathroom every day for a week. Are you going to now keep shutting people out of water? But that's the implication. So the FM makes an input to ensure maintainability. Can I have access? Are there manholes and suction chambers that can go into and check if there's a problem in this line? If a bulb is placed outside, that you cannot reach it, ask questions. Am I going to be even crazy every time to go and put a bulb into that light? There are so many questions you can be asking naively. I was in another building where security guards have to rush into the building to use the toilet before the doors are shut. Because between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. when the door is open again, security guards outside don't have a toilet that they can use. The building is a very fanciful building, very large and very uh, imposing. But with that small floor, the building becomes not very effective. So the FM needs to be involved. At the construction stage, things will go wrong, things will change. The FM's primary uh, 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 objective at this stage is to document change so that when facility is being handed over to you later, you have a history of all changes that are taking place. Change and variation management. So that someone does not go through a shortcut to deliver your project to you. At this stage too, the FM is also supporting the process of documentation. A building may be complete, but it's only 50% if you don't have proper documentation that describes, explains what has been built. So the FM at this stage is very, very careful to ensure that there's proper documentation. Especially as built drawings and they are built as built bill of quantities. Because things will be changed and culture is going on, those things need to be updated in those documents, the drawing and the bill of quantities. What happens at testing? At testing, we are using a template similar to the one you use in your lab test to check for the functionality of various operating parameters of the assets. If it works, it is fine. That's what testing does. So if the operating parameter is, oh, this thing is 1.97 kilowatts, and then uh, it is uh, uh, 20 amps, and then it's this and then it's that. When it's running, I want to see that those parameters are established. Then you have done your job. On the other hand, commissioning is different. Commissioning is not a check or test of functionality. It's a check or test of adequacy. If this call is cooling because the AC is working and there are just a few people in the hall. 
the AC will feel like a super AC because there are three people in the hall. If you now bring in 500 people into that hall, that AC will still be working as it was working before. In fact, working more now because the computer will not go off again. Because to reach saturation points will be very difficult because of the number of people you have in the hall now. But your commissioning is checking if that AC can meet the requirements of the people in the hall. And if it cannot, the commissioning has failed. So it's possible to test your generator, power the building, and plug one laptop in and say, generator is working, there's light in the building. But the generator is ready for 700 uh, uh, kilowatts, isn't it? Load 650 kilowatts and let me hear what the gen is going to say or do. Ah, because that gen needs to be able to meet the capacity for which that building was designed. Not that it works. That's commissioning. Commissioning has been something that has not been happening for most organizations. And I want you to challenge me with commissioning data that you have gathered in your organization. Handover is documentation. Handover is not key. Handover is not, is not uh, snapping pictures together to say we've handed over. Project is done. FM has taken over. No. Documentation is handover. I'm going to look at some of the documentation that are compulsory that you must have in place in your facilities. Those documentations are what describes your, the, uh, the facility, describe the various assets, describe the operation and maintenance of each of them, and so many other information. So by the time you get to facility management, you become the driver. You not only have a history of how the building grew like a mushroom and got finished, you also now have a documented playbook that tells you everything about that, that, that facility. So you can now fully own it and run it because of this commission that you have. All right, I'm gonna take another five minutes break. Um, not the usual thing, but let's take another five minutes break. I'll be right back, okay? Time now is, Six or four. So let's make it six ten. I'll be back. Continue with the operation readiness program.
Hello, guys. When you when you build you find out that there are a lot of hiccups that happens uh, during that transition phase. People move into apartments and offices and they are surprised by the kind of facilities they have. There's all kinds of protests. The FM has to live with all of this. Most of the problems that you encounter in a new project upon taking over are preventable. Most of them are preventable. It just required that a program should have been put in place that focused on operational readiness, a process for thinking through what is going to happen when people take over this facility. How is it going to be maintained? How is it going to be operated? All of those considerations being had brought in early enough during the planning stage. So all of those things we talked about, the FM getting involved in from planning to design to construction to testing, commissioning and handover are all embedded into a program called operational readiness. Build over a 30 year period, initial building costs account for possibly just 2% of the total. While operations and maintenance costs equal 6% and personnel costs equal 92%. In essence, in essence, what it simply means is that your immediate construction cost is one third of your total operating costs in the short term, 30 years. Right? So taking decisions to ensure that you have the right building and the right documentation so that that operations cost can be controlled over the life cycle of that facility is a no brainer. It's something we should all be uh, eager to have in place. Same thing with any corporate office. Looking, just looking at just the uh, construction versus operations and maintenance, it is 62% to 10% for original costs. That's the O&M costs. And if you add all the upgrades and capital renewal you do in the future, it is 10 to 90%. 90% will go into the facility on an ongoing basis compared to 10%. So if I put that in context in Naira, if you spend 10 billion building an asset today, you will require 90 billion over the next 30 to 60 years to operate that facility. Upgrade it, repair it, overhaul, replace components, and so on and so forth, including energy costs, which is very high. We have an operational readiness program. It means that you are thinking far ahead and you can protect the assets of your organization. Events will last longer and to ensure reliable income for the company on revenue generating um, uh, uh, activities. So these are the three uh, sets of documents that make up the operations and maintenance program, the technical and computing program, and the handover program. Uh, what I normally would recommend is because we have not been doing this as a practice in our development cycle or process in Nigeria, I will highlight a few of the items that you can put in as one plan. Documentation that you should work towards making sure are in place while a construction project is ongoing. Your schedule of assets, your asset register should come out of that construction process. That's number one. Number two, your operating manuals for all that was built into that facility. 
I'm not just talking about the manuals that come with your AC or elevator engine, no. I'm talking of operating manuals that interpret details of how lines were run, electricity were run, drains were run, both drawings and descriptions, including how they should be maintained and operated. It should actually come from the construction process. There's content information from manufacturers, because if those things begin to break later, you will need to contact manufacturers to get replacement. Many facilities have dropped in their value today because the FM has to get whatever is available in the markets without knowing the real source of the original stuff that were built into the buildings from the onset. Okay, safety procedures on how to operate and maintain the various assets, index of drawings and plans, maintenance shadows, like PPMs for those that require PPM, testing equipment and tools, what kind of equipment and tools will you need to run the various aspects of the building in terms of testing, um, system or equipment specification, that system of equi equi equipment specification. So you have, let me clear a bit that, that system or equipment specification, okay. Um, anyway, I'll, uh, you can easily um, uh, check, check that on your list. On the document that you have, uh, that line item is system or equipment specification. The specification is not a separate line item, okay? Um, what's the idea of understanding how your systems run? So that you can know exactly what can go wrong and be prepared for it. If you have a central air conditioning system, the AC is in place, it's working. You know the various operations steps you should take, but you don't know everything about that asset. If it breaks down today, what are you going to do? Do you write the manuals? Okay, that specification tells you the kind of equipment you are maintaining. So if you are talking to a consultant, you know exactly what you are talking about. Interfaces and parts list. How does one system interface with another? For example, your air conditioning system will interface with your uh, uh, electrical system because they're all plugged in and they're all taking power. So while you have ACs of different capacity, you have fuses and, and, and breakers of different capacities that are serving those ACs. And then parts list. What are the main parts that you have in each of your equipment? Which of these main parts we wear and tear and you need to replace them as spare parts? How much spare parts do you have in place from onset and how do you get to restock your spare parts? Information about your contractors, manufacturers, having as built drawings, bill of quantities, snag lists that were used to inspect and correct uh, situations on ground during construction, uh, uh, you know, GIS coordinates of the various uh, spaces, in fact, of your location so that you can actually put your location on the map of that, fa that facility. Uh, vendor details, suppliers and all kinds of vendors, guarantees and warranties for the various assets built in there, manufacturer's recommendation for different kinds of activities like maintenance, legal documentations. These include uh, things like permits and, and so on and so forth uh, for different things like boreholes, like uh, sewage plants, uh, uh, diesel tanks if they're they are very large and so on and so forth design modification information and then regulatory documents uh, warranty documents defect list training record of people that have been on ground that are taking over this management have they been trained have the artisans been trained have the managers been trained okay so if i were to if i were to narrow this list down i would say a schedule of assets is number one operating uh, uh, manuals is, is critical your part list and spare part list is critical. Your as built drawings is critical. Your as built bills of quantities is critical. I hope you're underlining these items. Uh, your guarantees and warranties is critical. Your legal documentation and permits, all of those land use charge and all the other things that will come back to haunt you if you don't follow them up is critical. And then training records, training provided for the team that's gonna be managing it are all critical to so being able to manage the facility on an ongoing basis. So these items can form your, 
they can form your short list of items that you must have from construction. Now, if you don't have them, uh, people that deliver the project don't give you this information. Um, uh, you know, you, you really are struggling to have this data. Then the asset register will ask you to develop now is a process, a way to reverse engineer the process of gathering that data. For your view drawings, you can actually get people in to measure your building and draw them out for you. The service will provide any data or any organization. There are so many things you can do to get the data that you need that you don't already have. It will cost a little money, but it's going to make your operations smooth, sailing going forward. Okay. So that's our lesson for today. Um, I'll need to see uh, your hands up for questions, comments, and a discussion before we end this class. Yes. Questions? Comments? Contributions? Now, sometimes some of the classes you're going to be taking in this program will sound a little bit advanced um, uh, because of where some of you are in your career, getting into the industry or just starting something, right? So, um, and then for a few people who are already advanced, uh, may, may be a, 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 it may look like something you're not practicing um, that may not be feasible in your, in your situation. Uh, but the whole idea here is to give you enough arsenal, enough weapons in your arsenal to be able to confront difficult challenges and make decisions smartly um, with, uh, uh, with uh, good strategic mindsets when you are faced with such uh, opportunities. Yana, let's hear your question. Uh, thank you. Thank you for beautiful delivery. All right, so my question pertains to the commissioning uh, aspect of uh, projects. Um, I think part of the concern I have is that the people who are supposed to take on take, take over the pro, the project at times, we may not have the kind of expertise to do a proper commissioning. So in that case, what can we do? Because I, I'll give an example, like in the plants, I noticed that where some of the the valves are positioned, they are positioned in upward position that for you to assess a valve, you need to erect a scaffold, get, and I was wondering who are the people that took over these projects? So how do we go about those kind of uh, issues? Okay, so the first thing is design needed to have been reviewed. Those things were in the mechanical design. Nobody picked them up. If the designs were reviewed, the construction change management was done to ensure that if designs are going to be changed, there's a process that should be followed so that all implications are considered. Right. If that did not happen, commissioning, testing and commissioning should throw that up. Right. At that stage, because an FM at in all of these stages are you are just a, an observer and contributor to the process. If you look at that that chart I showed you, you provide input at every stage. You're not the driver of any of these stages. But there must be evidence that you played your role in every stage and documented your contributions to the project. Commissioning is not a function that you perform as an FM for new projects. You are also observing the process of commissioning. But 
what we teach is that you should be very involved to the extent that you understand what the commissioning should cover because you are the one in fact there's another class we're going to do design build commissioning we're going to talk in more details about your role in the commissioning process i think i'll leave i'll leave i'll leave this for that but the bottom line in introducing it to you at this stage is to get you preps gets you ready to play more roles in the project delivery process even though you're not a driver you must contribute to ideas this is valve where I cannot use this. So of what you use is that valve. Is it a bed that will command from the sky to go and lock that thing for me when it's time to lock it? <laughs> you know, sometimes we laugh over things after they have happened, but they are very expensive engineers who are doing these things. On one of the sites here in Lagos, engineers decided that storm water was going to be drained by using perforated pipes into the ground in an area where the water table is already so high that the rainy season, the water is always on the ground. Where will the water percolate into? Where will be designing all those perforations? And, and I'm wondering, you know, if you carry a designer you use in Benin and it worked well in Benin, or you use it in Joss and it worked well in Joss, you bring it to Oniru, that is under the swamp, below sea level, and you do the same design. Who is going to check that design? That's what we are here for. Our job is not, is not to watch when they create you know, monsters for us to handle. It's just in a very humble and subtle way, chipping here and there some of these ideas that will get the guys who are designing and constructing to do the right thing because we are concerned about uh, 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 operational readiness, okay? So at that point where you are right now, uh, failure points are many before you see the valve on the sky. <laughs> uh, away, please go ahead. <laughs> uh, thank you, sir. My question is, uh, is not pertaining to this class, but one of the experiences I'm having these days is in our, our office complex, we have a communication where we have a five tons air conditioner working 24 hours. So the very uh, place on that on that that, place, uh, that communication is located at the fourth floor. So the uh, on, that, uh, on the ground floor, the immediate office under that particular form room becomes wet all the time. So we notice that there is conversation in, uh, going on at, uh, in that place due to the fact that the AC there is working. 24 hours. So we implement a two hours power AC there so that it can balance the temperature between the grand, the, the grand office and that communication office. So the condensation stopped. But anytime you just touch the wall, it's very cold. But we are still managing it. But we have to relocate back. We have to relocate one office there, uh, the existing office there from that particular uh, the grand floor office. So now that place. Is, there is no more office there, it's just an empty space for the connection and staff. And we are thinking of if we, are, if we should be running two hours power AC there without nobody using it, just to balance the temperature there. It's just as, as we wasting energy. Do you have any uh, technical approach you can use to stop that uh, condensation? That is there the are quite a few. Thing. There are quite a few. You could use, um, you could use a a, a, an insulation layer uh, before tiling in the room that is always being cooled. That way, the uh, the coldness will not be felt under the decking as much as you are seeing right now. Uh, second uh, option would be to ensure that the area under the decking that is uh, having so much condensation is well ventilated. Uh, you could also use a dehumidifier to suck, suck up um, humidity in that space, right? And then the last one is the one you have already applied, putting an air conditioner there to suck out that uh, humidity to balance the temperature. Uh, so so, so the, the truth is most slabs that we have in our buildings are not properly um, uh, done. Um, if you are on one side of a, if you are on the floor and this floor is very cold, 
the person on the on the on the bottom in that decking is not touching your decking and feeling that cold. That insulation is not proper. That separation between the two apartments has not been done well. And this is common in most of these townhouses and structures we're having around. They just build, you know, uh, 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 flimsy decks that the temperature can cause very easily, right? So if you were to have that, then you need to use a, 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 a kind of insulation, like a felting insulation before tiling, uh, that up to hold back that temperature, that cold temperature to that that room. Uh, alternatively, if you can't do that, as an as it maybe it's too expensive, then you use the gym. The humidifiers are quite cheap, right? They are just devices you can drop in the room. It runs like a fan, like a small box fan, and its job mm -hmm. is to you know collect all of this moisture, condense them into water that you can come and take out and throw out every day. Okay. Oh, okay, so ventilating that space gym fine will work for you. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys. Have a nice evening. Enjoy whatever is left of today. Uh, do your assessment as quickly as possible. Don't carry it over, and you'll have a good time. See you again on Saturday oh, next sir. week. I'm sir, not picking on Thursday. I'm not picking on Saturday on Thursday because I'll be in the, a training program in Abuja yeah, all week. Yeah. Uh, some other hands went up. Chaos. Thank you, sir. I I want to ask, sir, two questions. Okay. Now, who are the people expected to make um, input into the my facility strategic facility planning? Who are the people, maybe stakeholders I have to involve, who are, who are meant to make a good input in developing a strategic facility plan? My second um, question is, how long does it take to achieve that? Or is there any budget or cost that such a development of a plan may might attract? Okay. Thank Sorry you, sir. Don't question. You don't need to spend money to develop your strategic plan. Uh, I told you at the basic level, a plan is a series of questions with answers, right? So if you just ask questions um, about what do we have right now in terms of assets, what maintenance program do we have in place, what services do we provide for our customers, it can help you establish your baseline um, situation. And then if you now ask another set of questions in the next five years, how big will this company be? How many people should be working in this company? What kind of business will be into, right? You ask those questions and provide answers as best as you can. People to give you inputs will be senior management and unit heads or directors of various departments. But you can't go to them empty-handed. They will most likely not listen to you. If you tell them you are trying to work on a strategic plan to see how you can provide support for their future expansions and growth and progress, they will most likely listen to you if you came with some data from your own operations on how you see your current situation in their department. I currently provide uh, uh, seats for 10 of your staff. I provide cleaning services. I provide lunch for you guys. I give you IT services. I provide transport, uh, logistic services. Um, uh, so, so for 10, what is the next five years going to look like? Will you need bigger space? We need um, service levels to improve. Do you need um, uh, more services beyond the ones I'm currently providing? Those kind of discussions you will have with the various business units and then you come back and populate them into your strategic plan. You don't need costs, just dedicate time into coming out with, you know, an outline that you want to plan around. Okay, sir. Francis. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, sir, can um, a property development manager Taking this course, this particular strategic course, um, can it defer or how do I put it?
can I take this course, just this one course, and go and apply for a job as a property development manager? Because it seems to encompass so many things that is outlined in the job description for a property development manager. Exactly, exactly. Of course, you can. Anybody can take a single course in our training and, and go and apply it in, 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 the, in the work that they're applying for. Actually, we, actually have a, we actually have a package where we provide a single class. Anybody can attend a single class for 20K. We had it, uh, we had it in the system since 2017, but uh, patronage for the single class, single certificate for one class, uh, uh, did not did not uh, did not uh, you know did not sell fast. So we we we, we, we stop putting effort in marketing single classes for twenty k, right? Because we believe that the efforts that we are we are, we are training with a whole range of skills um, can function in multiple opportunities and, 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 and uh, uh, roles in their career. And so yes, because we have FM that start as an FM. And become a property manager, which is the highest position eventually, and begin to run development um, uh, for the organization. Yes, if you have somebody who's interested, yes, you can be interested in, but definitely um, we have not marketing that um, single class. Thing. Okay, so then um, is there a format? I think you've mentioned something similar. Is there a format for doing this analytical technique uh, in page seven? Is there, like you said, the uh, Barakat is going to send us from document for our projects probably that it's yes. part of them that it's a yes. format for doing all of this what you're going to and get then, projects is how to do your asset register how to do your commission assessments how to do your emergency planning how to do your health and safety audits how to do your maintenance program and how to do your budgets those are the six things you will get that is okay. the project you have to work on Okay, and how do we identify um, a threat and opportunity in changes? I mean, is there a checklist to identify? No, 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 no. You just think. It's just, just think. think. Okay. Yes, you just okay. think. Okay. okay, and that brings me to this question, the thinking. Yes. If you say develop an alternative in page 10 of our course, yes. will it be done just thinking or do you have to design the I mean, write out the alternative to say, oh, this thing, because in some cases, you are looking at the project and you are developing something in your head that if we do it like this, it's better. Is it better to say it or to put it in writing just to have an evidence? You create alternatives in writing. Don't, don't push one solution. Always have okay. alternatives. Respect the alternatives so you can come up with their implications, their pros and cons, their risks their costs, okay? All this, anytime you are thinking of alternatives, you write down the alternatives and you research. For example, if you are trying to solve a power problem, you think, generator, right? Yes. What are the brands of generator? You research that. Who are the suppliers? You call, ask questions on the cost. What are the advantages yes. and disadvantages of using generator to solve this power problem? You write. You research and write. Solar. If we're going to go solar, what is the capacity that we have to have? How many batteries? How many bees? What is the advantage advantage? How long will they last? What is the maintenance cost? So you are, you are developing all of those alternatives with detailed analysis. It takes a lot of research. Okay. So but now, thank you, sir. You mentioned just six documents that we are going to have in our project uh, file. Um, for making a report, for making this kind of analysis, is it just to be writing or there is a tabular way? Maybe you could just support us with some samples okay. of reports and analysis okay, there's, documents. There's no, there's no, there's no templates. I know where you are going. There's no templates for strategy. Right? There's no templates. Come up with some items you want to work on. It could be an outline. It could be a table. It could be paragraph by paragraph. It could be a financial analysis spreadsheet. Right? There's no template. Just ensure that you have enough information 
to stop. get management to approve but okay there's nothing you can find on google francis there's nothing you can find on google so if you go to google and say uh give me examples of uh energy documents right you will see that there's yes. no two that looks like the same Right? It brings a lot up for you to see. Just to get an idea of how people have developed different trend documents in the past, you can use Google for that. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. Gently, last question. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Um, mine is not actually a question. I just want to know if it is possible for us to have the material for this uh, strategic facility planning because it's not in the attachment it's not in the email for this the, class the attachment. yes for this class yes for this class don't you all have it the attachment is there not. yeah it is there sir you have to check the mail baraka sense not the reply from other colleagues yes i did and it's not there i, I replied the mail i replied the mail i didn't get it Okay, you know what? Uh, which of you have the material for this class that we just covered? Which of you have it? I have it here. Okay, please drop it in the WhatsApp platform. Yeah. Let him pick it from there. Yeah, we have it. Sure. Let one person drop it in the WhatsApp platform. Let him pick it from there. You know that if it comes in an email to everybody, there's no way to filter out one person from it. I suffered this thing three days ago. I got an email from uh, 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 a business uh, 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 partner, and the email did not come up in my inbox. I kept telling him I have not seen the email. He has resent it. He kept going to my spam. By the time I finally saw it in my spam, three attachments did not show. But there was that sign that there's an attachment, but I wasn't seeing it. It was just today when I was on a very strong internet, and I saw the whole attachment, attachment show up. So you might want to check that out again, uh, Kingsley, but Someone else could please just drop that in your WhatsApp platform and you will have it there, okay? Okay, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Please work on your assignment now and have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir.